Stop weeping. Behold the lion that is from the tribe of Judah. The root of David has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. And I saw coming out of the throne a lamb standing as if slain. Having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent into all the earth. You see, our Lord and Savior reigns. He is the prophet, the priest, and the king. He is on his throne. He is ruling and reigning even now. Stop weeping. Look and behold him. It changes everything. I pray that you are blessed to gather together and for us to sing the truth of God's word this morning. Turn with me in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1, the book of Ephesians in the New Testament, chapter 1. This morning we're going to begin a walk through the book of Ephesians that's going to take um, all of the spring, probably most of the summer. We'll see after that. We'll just see how long I can space this out, okay? Okay. So I'll give you a a little introduction to the book of Ephesians, but then we're going to jump into um, really a, a testimony of Paul's life today. Pound for pound, Ephesians may be the most influential document ever written. That's to quote Klein Snodgrass. And so I want you to get excited. I'm excited about God's Word and and walking through it and seeing what God's going to show us. There are lots of incredible truths, nuggets, that we're going to dig out of it. So uh, at home during the week, read over the book of Ephesians, okay? I'm going to give you some, some challenges and some charges from it, even to memorize large sections of it. We'll get to that next week, okay? But we'll begin in uh, Ephesians 1. Listen as I read the first two verses. uh, And then we're going to flip to the end of Ephesians. And I'll tell you in a second to Ephesians 6. So listen, Ephesians 1, the first two verses. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God to the saints who are at Ephesus and who are faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to you. And peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now flip to the end of Ephesians. Ephesians 6, 19. Oftentimes in a letter, in an epistle, you get uh, the context that the author writes, usually at the end. And so we're going to get and pick up some of that context. So Ephesians 6, 19. Paul says, pray on my behalf that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. How's that for a title? That in proclaiming that I may speak boldly as I ought to speak, but that you may know about my circumstances, how I am doing, Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will make everything known to you. I have sent him to you for this very purpose so that you may know about us and that he may comfort your hearts. Peace be to the brethren and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be to all those who love our Lord Jesus with incorruptible love. Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, we are so privileged to be able to gather together as your children and to open your word, to sing praises to you and to hear from you, trusting that your Holy Spirit will speak to our hearts. Give us the wisdom, the nourishment, the conviction, the truth the love, the encouragement, all that we need to be able to live godly lives in Christ Jesus, to walk worthy of you. That is our deepest desire. We pray this morning as we pause to think about this incredible letter 
of what we call the book of Ephesians. God, that you would take us in our mind to just understand the fruit of how it came to be and why it's so incredibly important. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Paul sits under house arrest in Rome, a prisoner. Now, his circumstances are considerably better than many other situations that he found himself. He is awaiting trial on a capital punishment case to find out if he is going to be executed or live. And he will have plenty of extra time on his hands in order for him to be able to write letters back to previous churches that he had planted. He has a young man named Tychicus who is with him, who will deliver a runaway slave named Onesimus back to his owner Philemon, along with a letter asking for his release. Now, while on that journey, Tychicus will also deliver the letter to the church in Colossae, as well as this one here to Ephesus. Now, it is most likely that what we call Ephesians is a circular letter, meaning that it is supposed to be passed around to many churches all throughout the Asia Minor area. There are two main reasons to think that. <clears throat> the first is that two of the three of our earliest documents on Ephesians do not have the term in Ephesus. It doesn't say to the church in Ephesus. And so, for that reason, is probably a circular letter to all of those in Asia Minor, as well as the fact that Paul had spent three years in Ephesus. And so, undoubtedly, he had lots of personal connections, and you find this letter almost shockingly impersonal. Okay, so based on those two things, it's best for us to understand that this is a circular letter, which frankly is to our benefit, because it means that we get uh, uninterrupted theological thought that flows out of Paul that is for all of us to feast upon. Ephesus is in modern-day Turkey. It blossomed as a Greek port city in the 4th century B.C. It became a major Roman city, okay, with a population of 25,000 people, all right? The fifth largest city in the Roman Empire, all right? So think about that. You need to think L.A., Chicago, whenever you think of Ephesus. Grand buildings and architecture, vital economics. Okay, they had the second largest library in the entire Roman world. A theater that sat 25,000 people. The impressive aqueduct system that ran all throughout the city. And, of course, the great temple to Artemis. One of the seven wonders of the ancient world, all there in Ephesus. Now, Paul's ministry in Ephesus, because he was there for three years, actually had this incredible impact. The gospel spread through Ephesus in such a powerful way that Christians began turning over their witchcraft and sorcery books into the town square, and they actually had this monumental book burning. Everyone brought them, and they had this monumental book burning. It was $50,000 worth of day wages, Acts 19.19 19 tells us, that book burning. Okay, that is five million dollars in today's money. The effects of the Christian revival, if you will, had spread so through that local silversmiths were feeling the burden upon the economy because they used to make all of these uh, little silver idols to Artemis and sell them. Well, their business had been hit so hard in the pocketbook 
that they begin to get angry and stir up a mob where they say, wait a second, these guys are teaching something against Artemis, and they get the entire mob to shout and to chant, great is Artemis. They rush to the theater where they gather together in an entire day. They get this frenzic mob because they wanted to fight for Artemis. Now, I tell you all of that because... I don't think we often think about the gospel having the power to change and to wipe through an entire city in incredible form. I mean, we may think, uh, sure, in in our little pockets or in, in in the heartbeat of America, the gospel has power, but in those big cities, they're a lost cause, you know? They're just, it's all too crazy. It's all too, I can't understand it all. The gospel can't do anything there. Well, that's simply not so. Because the truth of the matter is, is the gospel has the power to change. I wonder if you believe that this morning. We all love a good biography, don't we? Stories about heroes and sacrifice and courage. We most certainly love to view our own lives as a biography. All of our stories of heroism and everything that we've endured. But God offers us something quite different from a biography. He offers to us a testimony. A testimony. You see, in a biography, you highlight someone's heroic acts, and we often overlook their sin. We almost always turn these figures into mythical type proportions. They become so big, so large in our mind, we completely gloss over and pay attention to no sin. This explains why most people don't know that Gandhi beat his wife and had very bizarre sexual fetishes. Charlie Chaplin was a sex addict. Walt Disney, a racist. Even famous Christian leaders like John Wesley and A.W. Tozer were horrific husbands and absentee fathers who neglected their family. George Whitfield, the most famous preacher in the first uh, Great Awakening, owned slaves and even fought to legalize slavery in Georgia. But a testimony, on the other hand, is all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. A testimony doesn't ignore sin. Rather, it looks directly at sin, and we realize that Jesus has the power to change a life. A dramatic U-turn. I read the beginning and the end of the book of Ephesians so that we would see Paul as he discloses himself as the author and the circumstance we find him in. And in your mind, you immediately think, wow, how did we get here? Paul opens the letter, an apostle of Christ Jesus. He gives himself the title, an ambassador in chains. Now, that's a far cry from when we were first introduced to Paul, and it makes us long to hear his testimony. Because in Acts chapter 8 is when Paul first burst on the scene. He is going by his Hebrew name, Saul. And he is right there at the stoning of Stephen. He is seething with hatred and anger and bitterness inside of him. There is a drive that all who claim the name of Jesus Christ must be stopped. They must be 
the, the name of Jesus must be stomped out at any cost. And, and Paul will go to any and every length in order to make sure that it happens. Not over his dead body will the name of Jesus Christ continue to move forward. You see, there is a rage inside of him. A hatred. All he sees is red. Arrests, floggings, that's not enough. They must be killed. There is an evil sense of joy and power as he sits there over the presidings of Stephen being stoned where Paul says to himself, he is getting what he deserves. The shame of this entire, it's what he deserves. Listen to Paul's own account. He said, I was convinced that I ought to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And that is just what I did in Jerusalem. On the authority of the chief priests, I put money of the saint, uh, sorry, I put many of the saints in prison. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. Many a time I went from one synagogue to another to have them being punished and I tried to force them to blaspheme in my obsession against them. I even went to foreign cities to persecute them. You see, with papers in hand, Paul had all the authority that he needed to bust down doors and in the midst of screaming children to grab the father by the neck and to say, you better denounce Jesus right now. You better say that he is a fraud, that he amounts to nothing, or I will kill you. He has the rage of a terrorist. And at night, he can still hear the sobs of a widowed wife. He can still hear the pain in the voices of those who in an absolute panic recanted their faith. See, Paul starts by full disclosure of his sin. It is his testimony. He doesn't hide it one bit. He was dead in his sin. And then one day, everything changed. Amen. Acts chapter 9 narrates for us that Paul was on his way to Damascus. Now again, set your mind into this context. Damascus is 150 miles north of Jerusalem. It's going to take two weeks for Paul to get to Jerusalem, to Damascus. And he goes with letters, with papers of authority because they have, they have persecuted Christians in Jerusalem so much that they have spread out. And Paul says, I'm going to hunt you down wherever you go. And he's on the road to Damascus. And suddenly the resurrected Jesus stands in front of him. Paul is blinded by the light. But he can hear in the Hebrew dialect, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. And three days later, he would make his way to Damascus. And three days later, a godly Christian named Ananias would come and pray over him. And the scales would fall off his eyes and his darkened heart as well. And everything 
would change. One of the most dramatic U-turns in the history of mankind. And everything would change. How incredible is it to read the opening words, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. Paul is the name that Saul used in the Greek world. And wouldn't you know it? It means small. How fitting for the change in demeanor from his former pomp. And here he sits sits, and he titles himself an ambassador in chains. An ambassador in is someone, an official representative of a foreign nation or king. And under festive circumstances, you know, periodically throughout the year, an ambassador would wear chains, uh, usually with the pendant, of celebration of the glory of their nation. How fitting. Paul, sitting under house arrest who used to persecute even the name of Jesus Christ, now glories and gives himself the title that his chains are fitting of a crucified Messiah. And he who used to pursue and punish every last Christian now loves and shepherds them. A dramatic You turn a testimony. Praise God for powerful testimonies so that we can see with clarity the depth of sin and the change that Jesus Christ brings about. All across this room, there are so many of you that have powerful testimonies. You know what it's like to plunge the depths of despair and sin. Many of you grew up in abusive households. Addicted to alcohol or drugs. We're in abusive relationships, toxic thinking. Some of you, you would even say, have seen the depths of hell itself and been forever changed by Jesus Christ. Praise God for that. Praise God for that. You know, I do think we talk about powerful testimonies and dramatic U-turns to the point where sometimes you leave here and think, well, I wish I was a drug dealer or I wish I was a murderer. Why don't I have a dramatic U-turn? Well, many of you grew up in good Christian homes and that is your testimony. Listen to me, it's still one of sin against a holy God. You were dead, but now you are alive. It is a work of God. Here's the deal. If you came to Christ at an early age, that's what I want for my kids. There is power in your testimony. You've gone from death to life. You are a new creation. That is every one of our testimony. So we need to remember that. But at the same time, we need to celebrate powerful testimonies, dramatic U-turns. Why? Because it reminds us that God is still in the life-changing business. That is what he does. That is who Jesus came to save. It reminds us Jesus isn't finished yet. If the terror of, uh, uh, sorry, if a murder-filled terrorist of the church isn't too far gone for Jesus, well, then no one is. No one is too far gone for the blood of Jesus. No one. 
is too far gone for the blood of Jesus. Do you believe that? Will you say that with me? No one is too far gone for the blood of Jesus. I want you to say it one more time. I want you to shout it. No one is too far gone for the blood of Jesus. You need to hear that today. Because for many of you, children and grandchildren sit far away from the Lord. Many of them even hate Jesus. Listen to me. Don't stop. Don't stop praying. Don't stop smiling. Don't shop, stop sharing. Don't stop giving your testimony. Don't ever stop telling them about the blood of Jesus because no one is too far gone for Jesus to save. If, if Jesus could save and appear on the Damascus road to a terrorist and a murderer named Saul and if he could dramatically transform him, no one. Is too far gone. Church, we have to believe that. Now, the other truth that I long for you to see this morning is this letter of Ephesians. I want you to see how absolutely magnificent this letter that we hold in our hands is. Okay? I want you to see how it is the work of of God in circumstances that you and I would never put ourselves in, and yet it is what God did, okay? Most of us view our lives as an autobiography. That would be we get to write our story as we go, okay? Where we tell God, you know what? I would sure like this crowning achievement to kind of be about my life. And if we could accomplish this and this and this along the way, that would be great. And while we're at it, let's leave out those seasons of trial and suffering. Let's wipe all of those away. But again, God is not offering you an autobiography. Again, he's offering you a testimony. And a testimony, in the middle of a testimony, we find that when God is the author of our story, God intentionally uses trials and suffering and even our sin to work about his greater plans. When Paul is recounting his testimony to King Agrippa in Acts 26, he adds this fascinating detail about what Jesus said to him on the road to Damascus. You may have never picked up on it before. But he says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? And he says, I'm Jesus whom you're persecuting. And then he says this, it's hard for you to kick against the goads. Acts 26, 14. It's hard for you to kick against the goads. Apparently to kick against the goads was a common expression in the ancient world that rose out of a farming analogy. Okay? So when a farmer is driving a stubborn ox, he had a really long piece of wood that was pointed on the end and he would poke it in the rear to get it driving forward, right? It has to be hard enough that it hurts Okay, well, on occasion, the oxen, the stubborn oxen would get mad and would kick back. Well, how do you think that went for him? Because if the goad's there, it just stabs him in the leg and causes 10 times more pain, right? Hence the phrase, it's hard to kick against the goads. When Jesus says this to Paul, it means that the Holy Spirit has been working on Paul's life, but he has been kicking back against the work of the Holy Spirit. So now let's ask, when do you think that might have been? Certainly there was a number of things that were going on, but I propose to you and I adamantly think that one of those very moments was at the stoning of Stephen. Why? Because Luke is the author of 
Acts, who gets the firsthand account from Paul, and Luke goes out of his way in narrating the entire stoning of Stephen to go, and by the way, Saul was standing there giving hearty approval. I think that came from Paul himself. Because even though in that moment he had risen up with all sorts of encouragement and he was happy and he was delighted at the thrill of Stephen's death, when he hit his pillow at night, he couldn't get it out of his head. How could Stephen have responded that way? How could he have prayed for our forgiveness? How did he see Jesus Christ as if the heavens opened up in that very moment? And the Holy Spirit began to work in Saul's life, but Saul continued to kick against the working of the Holy Spirit. So that when Jesus says that to him on the road to Damascus, not only is he utterly broken, but he simultaneously is overwhelmed by the mercy that was shown to him. Jesus pointed out, I have been calling you and you have continued to resist. You are fighting against me and here I am. And Paul is overwhelmed by the mercy that is shown to him. And he makes a vow right there in his heart. And he says, Jesus, I don't ever, I don't ever want to kick against you again. I don't ever want to resist or turn down the voice of the Holy Spirit in my life ever again. If it means I have to kick against the goads of the world, so be it. I don't ever want to find myself against you, Jesus. The last time that Paul was in Ephesus, He was going through all the churches in Asia Minor and he was telling them that the Holy Spirit had called him to go to Jerusalem. You see, in Jerusalem, Paul was a wanted man. He might as well have had his poster up and said, a bounty, a reward, kill this man. And the Holy Spirit had told him, go to Jerusalem. But he hadn't told him anything else So in Paul's mind, everything is dark after Jerusalem. In fact, the Holy Spirit said, bonds and affliction await you. Paul told the churches in Asia Minor and Ephesus this. They begged him not to go, to which he replies, it's almost as if he could could hear Jesus say, it's hard for you to kick against the goads. And he remembers, Jesus, I don't ever want to be against you again. If I can hear your spirit, I'm going to go, even if it's against the world. Church, you hold in your hands the fruit of Paul's obedience. He didn't know what was going to happen. But the magnificent letter that God uses, that God breathed himself, the authority of Scripture that we have that breathes life 2,000 years later that we are going to walk through, that we are going to read, it comes out of the fruit of Paul saying, I don't want to kick against you. I want to be obedient Whatever comes, Jesus. You see, because he went to Jerusalem. And yeah, a mob grabbed him and tried to kill him on the spot. But by God's grace, the Roman army stepped in and put him in jail and awaited a trial. There were assassination attempt after assassination attempt. But by God's grace, they all failed. Paul, as a Roman citizen, made his appeal to Caesar to be transported to Rome, a place that he had longed to go, had been prevented from going. But Jesus told him, by the way, you're going to go to Rome. He was shipwrecked. 
He was bitten by a viper, but by God's grace, he got to Rome and he had enough time to sit and there under house arrest, the Holy Spirit of God overcomes him and allows him to write letters back to the churches in Asia Minor, but they're so inspired, they're God breathed and they change our life today. The power of the word of God, all because Paul said, Jesus, I don't want to kick against you. And now listen to this. Listen to this. Listen to how he prays in under house arrest as he awaits his capital punishment. In 619, Paul says to his friends, pray on my behalf that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains that in proclaiming it, I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Paul's the boldest man that you and I have ever heard of. And yet he is sitting there praying for boldness. Why? Because he knows the tendency that's inside of every single one of us. He knows the tendency for us to want to write our own stories, for us to want to protect our own neck, for us to want to not trust that God's going to work it all out according to his plan. And the way that we do that is we cut corners and we cut out boldness. Right? We leave out the things that we know are offensive. We do not press that Jesus Christ is Lord, that there is no other way to heaven, that every knee must bow to him, that you will bow to him. You will. Whether this side of glory or on the other side in a place called hell, you will bow the knee. We leave all of that out. And Paul says, I know my tendency, but I don't want to. I don't ever want to kick against the goads of Jesus Christ. I want to be obedient. Would you pray that I would have boldness even as I await a capital punishment trial? I don't ever want to neglect the gospel. God wants to write your testimony. He's not interested in a biography or an autobiography. He wants to write your testimony. He wants to take that rebel will and transform it into a humble, meek servant so that the cry of your heart would be just like Paul's, I don't want to fight against you. I don't ever want to turn down the voice of the Holy Spirit in my life. I don't want to be so distracted. I want to hear you, Lord. I want to hear you. I want you to use me. I'll be obedient. I will kick against the goads of this world as long as I know I can hear you. He wants to write a testimony. He's not done. He's still working. No one is too far gone. It's always a question. Will you surrender? Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, Oh, we certainly love your word. And we love the gospel. The good news that Jesus came to save sinners like me. And you never stop pursuing. You never quit. There's nothing too disgusting for you to cleanse and to redeem. Father, forgive us when we forsake the gospel. Forgive us when we are not bold as we ought to be. Forgive us when we do not believe that you can change. 
As if so-and-so's heart is just so irredeemable. Forgive us, Father. For it's those you came to save. And truth be told, we were no different. God, use us. Use us. We want to hear your voice. We don't want to kick against you. Forgive us for so many times kicking against you. Would you, in your kindness, speak to us yet again? We don't deserve it. You certainly don't have to. But would you? Father, I pray all across this room, all across living rooms, that you would be speaking, that you would do what only you can do. Allow us to hear. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.